John Driscoll Hopkins, it is such a pleasure to have you on our podcast, my friend. I love the Zach Brown band, and I love your solo album, Lonesome High. I'm envious of your rich, smooth voice and your range. How you effortlessly hit those low notes is a gift. Thanks, Tim. Your voice sounds really good. I heard there were some improvements. Um, a lot of this AI stuff is going to help us before it comes to kill us all. <laughs> before it takes you know, the world over. Terminator style. <laughs> um, right now, we're enjoying the, the benefits of that technology, and your voice sounds great. Maybe you need to come to the studio and we'll take your new voice and I'll I'll make it into a song. That'll be cool. <laughs> it's through Eleven Labs. They really have incredible technology. Yeah, the company that does it is called Eleven Labs. They actually it's so funny you brought that up, Pop, because they reached out to me at the end of last week and they just asked me, they have a new version of it that can make the voice sound like it's singing. And I said, I, I said, I heard my dad try to sing when, when he was healthy, and I don't think they want to mm -hmm. even make a synthetic version. <laughs> well, you know, the synthetic version will admittedly be better than the original. So, I mean, I, I don't know if you saw, but um, Randy Travis just put out a new album. You know, he had a stroke many years ago. and. Um, he just put out a new song, not an album, and they had someone sing in his style, and then they replaced it with an AI version of his voice, and wow. it's incredibly accurate. It's amazing how um, the technology can uh, make people sing. I'm, I'm just curious. You obviously have a really... Uh, unique style, which is one of the things you're known for, but is that something you would want to do? Would you want that or would you not want someone, I guess it's like kind of a, singing such a personal thing. I mean, I think I can speak for everyone when I say no one wants a computerized voice over their real voice. But if I were faced with um, that option where I I had something I had to get out and I couldn't do it. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I would just say I really want, you know, Brandy Carlisle to sing this song and let's see if we can get her to sing it or if I would um, try to recreate my voice. I guess it would depend on the song. You're listening to Tim Green's Nothing Left Unsaid, and my voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Before we get into your music, let's take it back to your childhood. What was your relationship with your parents and three brothers like? What was your favorite memory as a kid? My parents are incredible. They are um, in good health. 82 and 77, living in Gainesville, Georgia, where I grew up. And um, my three brothers um, have lived um, West Coast, New York, Florida, back in the Atlanta area now. So we get to see each other a lot. And we are um, a very close-knit group. Uh, the past three years since my diagnosis, we've made an effort to um, make spring breaks together with all of our kids. Whereas, you know, most of the time I'd see them at Thanksgiving and Christmas, but we're making more efforts to be together um, since my diagnosis in December of 2011. But, um, you know, my mother, my mother is a saint and she raised four big boys. And um, we broke everything in the house. Um, but um, we're all Eagle Scouts. And um, we all do know how to mind our manners, whether we choose to mind them or not. Um, 
So I, I think um, my parents have done an incredible job of teaching us um, right from wrong and uh, good work ethics and um, to, to live honorably. Um, the second part of that question was, what was my favorite memory? I, I think my favorite memories are always the holidays. You know, um, when I, when I write or create, I haven't written any Christmas songs, but when I make these, um, holiday records, I'm doing it so that I can relive all of those times when Santa visited our house and my brothers and I used to get so excited and now I'm excited when he comes to see my kids and um, I think that's probably the biggest thing and and we still on Christmas day we we uh, gather at my parents house and we all get together and 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 uh, have a uh, um, dinner and open gifts, and we just enjoy being together. How about high school? Were you into theater then? Who got you into singing? The football coach must have been drooling to try to get someone your size to play. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I played football in ninth grade, and it was only because the football coach saw me on the field and said, you need to come out and, and, uh, try out for the team. And I was a swimmer all my life. And, you know, whenever I get the opportunity, I'll still put in a thousand yards in the pool. But, um, I really enjoyed playing football, but starting in ninth grade, I, I didn't know how to hit anyone. Um, I didn't know what the, what the two hole was. I mean, it was like, you know, damn it, Hopkins hit the two hole. I'm like, ah, you know, so, um, I went back to the pool and, um, I've always been a singer in the church. Um, I think. Daybreak Choir at First Baptist Church is probably where I learned um, most of my knowledge about harmony and then took it from there and ran. And, of course, uh, Gainesville High School has one of the best theater programs in the state, Um, and that's largely due to its director, Pam Ware, who taught me everything that I needed to know about being an an ensemble and working with people. And to that end, you learn a lot about what it means to be in a band and how to deal with this personality and that and and make a cohesive unit on stage. And um, my... uh, high school theater experience was uh, incredible. And we're just this tiny public school in Northeast Georgia, but she has a way of motivating people. Um, She taught there for 40 or 50 years and um, she's still a, a firecracker, but I don't think she's teaching anymore. But, um, I owe, a lot of my experience to Pam Ware and to Jimmy Cutrell, who was um, passed on and uh, he was my choir director. Did you do any like singing classes or singing coaches or it was really more just church and and through school? I I had um, some official vocal uh, lessons from James Kent in Gainesville and um, he was really great with working with resonance. And um, and then later I was a student of Jan Smith in my 20s. 
But um, when I went to college, there were, you know, Florida State has some vocal classes within the theater department that that are advantageous, but not really singing classes and, unless you're in um, an actual musical. But um, when I got to Florida State in 91, I was a junior and uh, I had transferred from Georgia and I was in a band within a week and um, I played nonstop for two and a half years and then graduated and stayed there and kept playing, moved to Atlanta in 95 and never looked back from music. I've enjoyed being in a couple movies and being in some plays since uh, my graduation from Florida State Theater, but it's always been music for me since uh, since I was about 20. But in high school, did you want to be a professional musician or you just like to play and sing? I originally wanted to go to Florida State in their uh, BFA program, which I was accepted into, and and I didn't. Um, I had a few pressures on the outside that directed me to Georgia, and um, I eventually got to where I needed to be. But um, out of high school, I was sort of raring to go with the artistic thing and uh, got sidetracked for a couple of years and tried to do a, a more um, a less artistic path and that just didn't work for me. Hop, did you have any other interests? Chicks. <laughs> Swimming chicks and music. <laughs> well, you know, we grew up right next to Lake Lanier. So when I was 16, I worked in the stock room at Belk Department Store at Lakeshore Mall. And um, if I worked early, I'd get off work and, and take my dad's boat. My dad has a uh, an 80s uh, Galaxy ski boat, and it's on a trailer. And so I would take the pickup truck and I was on the lake every opportunity that I could be. And, um, we loved water skiing and wakeboarding and kneeboarding. And, um, I've always loved snow skiing too. Um, I think those hobbies, um, were really important to me when I was younger. I, I wish I could still do that stuff, but um, I would be a yard sale on a snow slope right now. Um, but um, I do love the mountains and uh, being outdoors and being on the water. That's my dad's. That's his uh, music to his ears. That's his favorite stuff. Still to this day, we got a uh, hop. We, we got a custom boat. That's ADA accessible. So we pull the boat up and he goes off the dock onto the, uh, in his wheelchair onto the boat. And there's enough room for him to be able to turn around and stuff. It's actually a pretty, a pretty funny story. So he goes, he said, Troy, I want, I want a boat that I can fit on, but it needs to have, it needs to be fun enough to get all the grandkids to want to get on the boat. Cause he <laughs> said, I know if I get the grandkids, then you guys, my you know, his kids, my kids will have to get on the boat too. Right. And so it's a it's a pontoon boat. It's an aircraft carrier. Yeah, yeah basically, <laughs> it has a second story with two slides and a high jump. Oh wow! And so and cool. uh, the water is still freezing where we are. But I uh, my my three year old son is out of his mind, and he just went down the slide into the ice cold water. He made me do it with him. We just did that uh, this past weekend. So, anyways, yeah. My dad we talked also. about um, trying to retire one day on a um, a gradual slope uh, up onto um, Lake Blue Ridge. It's one of our favorite lakes, and um, we also love Lake Oconee out in East Georgia. But um, 
you know, build a ranch where if I needed assistance getting around, I could still get around and, um, and maybe get down to the water. And, you know, that would be a, uh, a best case scenario for our retirement. But my kids are just, my twins are just finishing sixth grade tomorrow. So, um, you know, I got a couple years in this school district before we, uh, cut and run. But, um, uh, it, we live in a great neighborhood and I've just always thought that, um, that, uh, the lake living would be the way for me. After high school, you first went to Florida State. What attracted you to FSU? Chicks. <laughs> no. Um, their theater program, um, their musical theater program at the time that I went there was top five in the nation. And um, they have always had an incredible music department and theater department. and. Uh, you know, lots of colleges have a um, hundred majors, fifty theater majors. Their programs are really small. Um, when I was at Florida State, it had four fifty, five hundred majors. The co- the competition was um, stiff, and um, and that's closer to reality. You know, I I was in um, three plays down in Tallahassee. One in a community theater, one in the lab and one on main stage. And um, just being surrounded with that much dedicated talent really made an impression on me. Um, But that's the, that was the um, main reason I went is because their theater school is uh, so excellent. And I was determined to to get a good arts education and um, and then go be an artist. What was your favorite role you had in your theater career? I think my favorite role was as a senior in high school. We did a show that was um, statewide. So we held auditions from um, all the uh, theater programs across the state of Georgia to come audition for this um, play. And it it was called The Fantastics, and I played El Gallo. Um, It was a lead role for me, and the music is incredible. Um, I got to work with a guest director named Bob Johnson and um, just being able to stretch out into uh, a different cast with people that I hadn't grown up with really made me feel like um, I could do this in other places, you know, Um, you, you get really comfortable when your hometown uh, you know, tells you how great you are, and you're like, well, you know, that's mom and her friends. They're all telling me I'm good at this. And then um, you go out into um, uncharted waters, and people say, you're really good at this. And you're like, okay, well, maybe I am. It's not just my mom. Um, but it gave me confidence to to get out there and and perform in front of uh, other people and with other people. In college, you were the front man for a band called The Woodpeckers. What's the story behind that, and were you guys any good? Shit. <laughs> um, we couldn't come up with a better name than Woodpeckers, and we were 20. So, uh, you know, that name stuck. And um, we had a a picture of a, it was actually a roadrunner behind us. We 
we probably could have gotten sued. I figure, I feel like this, um, logo belonged to someone else, but he had a drink and he and a cigar and he was like, you know, um, just this hell raising, um, live fast bird. And, um, and we covered like classic 80s stuff like REM, but we also, were into the new like it was the early nineties and we were covering Pearl Jam and Nirvana, um, Rage Against the Machine. We were more of a, a songwriter band with an aggressive edge. Um and um we put out an album under the name Distant Relatives and um then we broke up. <laughs> You know, uh, college bands are often like that. You you get faced with, is this really what I want to do with my life? And it's a tough road. And then some guys say, uh, no, it's not. And um, and I went on to do music, and uh, the rest of them are hobbyists. And um, and. They're all still very talented, but we all make choices, you know. Do you still stay in touch with them? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't really lose me um, once you get me. Um, I, I pick up with lots of people where I left off 20 years ago. And... Um, that's the case with all these guys, you know, they, they were my absolute best friends in the world. And, um, and you don't lose that. So, um, you know, that, that band really taught me how to organize travel with uh, equipment. And we had a trailer and we were driving to, Alabama and South Georgia and, and uh, the surrounding area near Tallahassee. And, um, and it made me understand what it was like to be in a, an independent touring band. Uh, we played almost every bar in Tallahassee from 91 to 94. And, um, we played every fraternity and sorority and we made a lot of friends and we were very popular. And then you graduate and you have to figure out, you know, you're 23, but now you have to go make a living. Um, and, um, and that prepared me for making a living. I like that line a lot. Once you have me, you don't really lose me. That's great. Yeah. After college, you moved back to Atlanta and formed your rock band, Brighter Shade. Were you the classic starving artist during that time? Can you describe what your life was like then? Did you ever have any doubts about your music career? Or did you just feel like you were destined to be a success in the music business? You know, I've never been accused of starving. <laughs> I'm way too big to have been <laughs> emaciated, but Brighter Shade started in late 94 uh, as Distant Relatives was ending, and um, it was basically me and Andy Birdsall, uh, and we were, we often called ourselves the Indigo Guys, because we would be uh, two acoustic guitars singing harmony at any, at anyone's venue that would have us. And, um, the next year we added bass and then that summer we added drums in 95 and we put a record out in 96, um, that we recorded in our garage of the house we were renting. Um, those choices that we made about 
where we should be playing and for who and for how much money and what our um, goals are and this, that, and the other. We were making it up as we went along, and I often um, was the default leader of that group, and I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I was so driven to succeed. It's like, okay, we live in North Atlanta. We're going to go to Statesboro and play at the Buffalo Wild Wing, and then we're going to go to Valdosta and play that one. That's Friday and Saturday night, and we're going to make 400 bucks um, on each gig. And we have to get hotels. And, you know, you drive down there, and you end up coming back with $620 for the week for four guys. You know, and one time the transmission blew up, and that was, you know, $800 of towing. And you have all these these things that that make you want to quit, make you want to uh, go do something a little more um, stable, you know, go work for a big company or get a job in a store or something, you know, move on to out of this um, independent music scene. And I think um, the reason I'm here today as a musician is I never quit. Um, You know, a lot of people get frustrated and move on. and, And I double down lots of times you know i i got into recording other bands and that would uh, provide a service that i could you know recruit and and eventually raise my prices as i was getting better getting more gear so that was kind of my fallback plan um we definitely lived um, in the $20,000 a year range for several years and um, went into credit card debt and and just were swimming in, um, in issues for many years before I, I leveled out as a... Um, record producer and studio owner in the late 90s early 2000s i i smoothed out my life a bit and um focused on recording and that's where i met zach i met him recording his first album when you right right when you met him did you did you know he had something kind of special well i mean Zach is a great singer. He's a great front man. But all of these um, accolades and this incredible band that we have is timing. You know, I mean, one move to the left or to the right when you should have gone the other way, and you're in a totally different situation. Um Zach always has been a good singer and a good songwriter and a a good guitar player. Um, But I think um, his drive is probably more important than all that, you know. And, um, you know, my dad always said, surround people, uh, surround yourself with people that are better than you. Um, And I think we've all adopted that uh, in our lives and and in our businesses. You know, we're constantly trying to learn from our environment and improve ourselves. And, um, yeah, I think Zach is special, but, but we, without the right timing and 
without, you know, an incredibly dedicated work ethic, nothing gets done. So in the early 2000s, you started getting into the production side of the business. During that time, you recorded two albums with Brighter Shade. And as you mentioned, you met Zach Brown as well. How did you first meet him? So um, my first Brighter Shade album was 1996. And then in the late 90s, I was the host of a um, an open mic night at a place in Buckhead uh, in, in, called CJ's Landing. And um, Zach came in to participate in my open mic. And he was 20 at the time. And, uh, you know, we had to put the X on his hand, you know, no beers for you. And, um, and, uh, he, he did a great job and, um, we remained friends through, uh, the next few years. And in 2001, I released, uh, the second brighter shade album and, um, Zach and I started recording his homegrown album. Um, he was still traveling between um, Atlanta, Panama City, and Birmingham on this um, three-city um, sort of forever tour. He he had places in each of those cities that would um, that he would visit, and then he would he would make enough money to, to keep going. Um, and so the album took several years to complete and, and he started selling it in the bars around 2004, like beginning of end of 2003, beginning of 2004. And in, um, 2005, he came in, to the studio again and started working on toes and I guess he was planning to make another album and um, and I helped him finish that song and before he left he said you know I'm looking for a bass player if you hear of anyone and I said well I'm playing a lot of bass these days and um, I'll come sit in with you until you find someone and uh, I never left. Two thousand. What year was that? Two thousand five. Uh, February twenty third um, was my inaugural Dixie Tavern gig with Zach. When you and Zach first became friends, what did you bond over? Was it just music or anything else? Chicks. Um, <laughs> music first and foremost. Um, you know we. We share a lot of the same favorites like James Taylor and the Eagles, Indigo Girls. And, um, I think I probably showed Zach, uh, Ani DeFranco and he showed me Daryl Scott. You know, we, we have, um, always been very similarly wired in terms of our musical tastes. And um, mine have sort of branched off into metal and his have sort of branched off into pop. Um, but but we started with these acoustic guitar harmony singers. And, um, and that's sort of always where my heart will be. And I believe uh, where his will always be as well. It sounds like too you you finally met somebody who matched your work. Oh yeah, based on how you're describing oh, yeah. him, right? It sounds like and, he, you know, he would he would find ways to get more studio time, even when he was broke. He he showed up with a PS2 and a crate full of games and um, a mini fridge one time. He's like, "Can I trade you this for some studio time?" I was like, "Sure, man." <laughs> I need a mini fridge in here, and um, the PS2 would be great. You know, people waiting for their time to record. They're just sitting over there going for it. So he was always very creative in his ability to get things done. Um, 
But yes, uh, an incredible work ethic. And um, in many ways, um, I've always been sort of a big brother to Zach. And even now, when he is so specifically the boss, um, I feel like a big brother to him still. You know, um, some of those vibes and and uh, nuances of our relationship will never change. You joined Zach in 2005, but it was three years before the band's debut single went to number one on the top 40 charts. How excited were you when you got that news? It was crazy, man. I mean, we got radio in 2007, eight, something like that. Chicken Fried sat on the charts for 40 weeks or something like that. I mean, almost a year. It was just slowly burning up the radio waves. And by the time it got number one, people knew it so well already. And they had heard it so much. I mean, that's kind of what you hope for is a slow, you know, top 40. You start at 40. You go to 39. (laughs) I mean, if you can get that and you're on, you have a song on top 40 radio for a year and don't fall off, it was incredible. By the time we were number one, I I think we were at John Rich's bar on Broadway in Nashville, which is really weird because we're, we had started spending more time there, but we never lived there. And um, and we were we hit number one. I remember looking at Jimmy and and we had drinks in our hand, and we, it was Friday night or something. And we're like, "Where's the fireworks? You know, uh, what's supposed to happen next?" And um, and it was sort of a moment where, well, we're number one, and no one is calling us. <laughs> you know, obviously, big things happened after that, but it was um, sort of poetic that we were in a rock star's bar in the biggest music town in the world, and standing there and the clock turned over and we're number one and we're like, cheers. <laughs> you know, there wasn't this big fanfare. What did you, what, what was the biggest, like all of a sudden you hit number one, like you said, in that exact moment, there's no fireworks or anything like that. But did your guys' lives change from hitting number one versus just being in the top 40? Or once you're in the top 40, was there all of a sudden your popularity grew? And- yeah, my daughter was you know born I mean? in, um, November 4th, 2008. And we were on a long stretch of radio um, performances promoting chicken fried. And I remember I went home 10 days before, so uh, late October. And I came back 10 days after, mid-November. And when I left, we didn't have security. And when I got back, we had security. We had, like, two bodyguards walking us to the stage. I'm like, what happened? You know, um, (laughs) and it went number one shortly after that. And um, it's incredible how quickly we rose from bar band to um, venue headliner. And um, a lot of that, you know, was uh, being best new artist at the Grammy. You know, people who didn't know found out. And those who did know, um, 
were were supporting us so very much, and um, sometimes that's a kiss of death. But it was not for us. It was a a catapult. It's just so crazy to think that you're you're literally playing bars and you know uh, Buffalo Wild Wings, and then all of a sudden, I mean, it's not that sh- not that long of a time, and now you're like you just said, security yeah. guards and headlining venues. I mean, it's just such a crazy. Yeah. It was and, such a short, you know, my drummer in my band, Mike Rizzi, um, always tells the story. He was living in LA. He had uh, moved from uh, Atlanta to Los Angeles at the time that we were awarded best new artists. And I hadn't seen him in a, a year or two and he's watching the Grammys and they say, Zach Brown band. And he's like, I know that guy. I know Zach Brown. I met him in Atlanta. And we go up on stage and he's like, that's up. You know, like he, I hadn't seen him in three years and he didn't know I was in the band. You know, Um, it's that fast. It's that kind of rocket ship, you know. And um, we just have held on for dear life for a long time and and it eventually has evened out and we're more comfortable now you know Uh, but I've been in this band 19 years it's crazy Hop I have heard you say how much you love your wife can you tell us how the two of you met we were dating when I was at Florida State and um, we were sort of non-exclusive back then and in the early 90s we tried to to really be together and um, and be a, a couple and I had moved to Atlanta and she was uh, graduating Florida State, and she had designs on Florida, and um, she moved to Fort Lauderdale. So we were doomed to connect then. And then 12 years later, I was in South Florida, and I thought of her and randomly reached out and I hadn't spoken to her in seven years because she had a, a serious boyfriend and they were talking about, you know, marriage and stuff. And so I'm like, you know, it'd be nice to say hi, but she's probably got kids now and whatever. I'll just say hi and wish her well. And she didn't. So, um, we made um, a lot of changes in our lives after we um, reconnected and we made sacrifices to be together. And in 2007, um, in uh, late in that year, she moved to Atlanta. And then the next year we were married. Um, she has always been dear to me, even though um, we weren't able to make it happen when we were young. But hell, guys, I wouldn't wish what I was going through on anyone uh, in my early 20s because it was insane how um, ridiculous our lifestyles were and how, and how busy we were with with very little success. So it was um, exciting to get to to reconnect with her at a time when the band was still, you know, not famous, but a year and a half later, she got to enjoy the the rise. Um, And um, she is my heart. And um, she's been incredible um, throughout every aspect of my uh, career and my diagnosis. It seemed like once you guys got going, you couldn't make an album that wasn't loaded with hits. 
And when you're not touring with Zach, you are playing with Brighter Shade or producing in your studio. Then I also see you taking on unique projects in the heavy rock and bluegrass genres. When the heck do you sleep? Also, what has been your favorite project outside of the Zach Brown Band? Well, <clears throat> Brighter Shade um, still plays once in a blue moon, but um, we have enjoyed lots of performing art centers with my band. Um, you know, we still come up with some really catchy stuff with Zach, but it doesn't always um, result in a number one. You know, same boat went number one recently, but that was the first one in a while. Um, what we do really enjoy is uh, a dedicated touring fan base that keeps us in these big amphitheaters and baseball stadiums um, year in and year out. You know, we've got a, a great fan base that really enjoys coming to see live music. I think um, I'm really proud of that Lonesome High CD, but I'm also proud of all my Christmas records, you know, yeah, the Christmas albums all have a theme. Um, they're they're uh, Georgia-based musicians, the Atlanta Pops Orchestra, Joe Granston Big Band, ATL Collective, and this one with Yacht Rock Review. So I'm I'm proud of all of that work, and and it's really exciting to get to be you know, in these other groups for a while. What about the your favorite song you did with, with the Zach Brown band? Which one would it be? Goodbye in Her Eyes. Any particular reason why? Well, I I contributed to that one a little bit and I just felt like it's a really solid song all the way around. And um and it always gets a great response. Three years ago, your story and mine intersect. Unfortunately, it's a nightmare scenario. Can you please tell us what led to you finding out you had ALS? Yeah. In 2019, I was on the road with the band and um, I started taking... Uh, statin drugs for cholesterol and shortly thereafter my um, hands were slowing down for some reason um, I wasn't able to double time on the right hand with um, the faster songs and um, in a, at first I thought it was just the statin use and um in the spring of 2020, I uh, sat down with everyone on the bus and I said, something is wrong with me. Um, I keep falling down. I'm, I'm rushing to get somewhere and I'm tripping and my hands are not responding. I, I feel like I can't run. Um, and then... The next week, COVID hit, and we were out of commission for 18 months. When we came back in uh, 2021 in the fall, um, it was worse. Um, my walking had been more affected and my playing. Um, and it was then that we started seeing neurologists and it was the third neurologist that we saw that uh, diagnosed me with ALS. The first two missed it. And, um, uh, you know, that I, I was largely unfamiliar with the details of the disease. I just knew it was really bad. And um, 
course, I'm an expert now. Um, but to be sitting here, um, to have driven here and be driving home two and a half years later is a incredible an incredible blessing and and I recognize that my progression is uh, very slow and I'm very grateful for that but um it's not a club that any of us want to be in and um and I have tried to figure out if there was something I did to trigger it or if the statins did or, you know, what is going on with our world? Why are there so many Alzheimer's patients? Why are there so many more ALS cases? Um, Why are they going to increase by 40% in the next 10 years? We're doing something to ourselves that uh, is ruining our health. Um, You know, unfortunately, we can't all at least point to head trauma. Um, we, We can't all point to toxic environmental uh, conditions like the military or airline pilots. Um, there's a lot of us out there that are just like, is it my biome? You know, is it my gut? Um, so the mystery continues. And, um, um, I'm just grateful to to still be active even though I'm not nearly as active as I should be. When you first got diagnosed, were you in denial about it or were you kind of relieved that you had, maybe you had finally an answer? There was never any relief. Um, We spent months um, trying to wrap our heads around it. You know, lots of tearful days and nights. It was three days before Christmas, you know. Um, It was a really difficult time, but we jumped in feet first and went to um, the Gleason Gala in March, and that was inspiring, and we met a lot of people and learned about this community that uh, is so dedicated to to correcting this uh, unfortunate motor neuron damage that we're all suffering from. And um, I have slowly come to grips with it, but here I am walking, talking, breathing, chewing, and and I have no concept of what Tim goes through every single day. And, um, you know, Tim, you and Steve and these guys who uh, persevere and live such vibrant lives in chairs are an incredible inspiration to me. And, and I, I just admire your courage and your dedication to your families and to providing this community with insight and knowledge. Um, You know, I'm going um, to D.C. next week with Brian and Sandra Wallach, and and we're going to meet with the IMALS crew and talk to politicians and and powers that be and you know this this quest that hop on a cure is on to find a cure um, has to be met with um, perseverance and and pleading with people 
like the government who control so much of the poison that we ingest. Um, and we're, we're going to make a difference uh, step by step, day by day. I know this is an extremely personal question, but I ask it without judgment or preconceptions. I have heard you say that one has to stay positive when fighting this disease, and I think that is spot on. However, you are in the early stages, and I pray they find a cure before you get to my stage, and I think they are close. But if you get to my point, you have to have a greater perspective that includes both life and death. What I want to share with you is my faith in Jesus Christ. I want to share a story with you. A guy who has ALS contacted me four years ago, Tom Walpole. He said he was ready to give up, but then he saw me on TV saying that I wasn't going to quit. So Tom decided he was not going to quit either. We developed a friendship over the last four years, occasionally emailing one another to share our strength. Well, a little while ago, his brother John emailed me that Tom was in the hospital and the doctor said he only had a few days left. I had never spoken to him about his faith, but I offered to have my pastor stop by and told him that it was not too late to accept Jesus into his life. And his brother emailed me back that Tom and their entire family are devout Christians. When my wife and I went to his funeral service at the church, it was a mixture of sadness and joy. On one hand, Tom was gone. On the other hand, he was at peace with the Lord. Now, if you have a religion besides Christianity, then I have to respect that. But if you don't, I want to urge you to look into it further. I can recommend some quick and painless books by C.S. Lewis if you want. There, I've said it as well as a shabby Christian can say it. I'm a C.S. Lewis fan, and I've been a believer my whole life. But thank you so much, and nothing left unsaid. Um really speaks to what you just said, you know, um, sharing your walk and your faith uh, is uh, very important. So thank you for that, Tim. I was a young life leader when I got to Georgia, and um, a lot of the guitar playing that I learned was leading young life clubs with songs and um and in little bands. And um, one of my biggest spiritual influences, aside from Jimmy Cutrell and the choir, was uh, my young life leader, Skip Eckie. And um, he's still a volunteer in, in, uh, in my hometown of Gainesville. And... Um, uh, uh, it's always been very important to me to have a relationship. I am so happy right now. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you, Tim. Hop, let's end the podcast with you talking about your magnum opus, your greatest work. But it's not your music. It's your daughters. Please tell us what makes each one special. My girls are unique. Um, they are a product of their incredible mother and um, of my um, gruff protective instincts. And um, Grace is a uh, an athlete with a, a very um, dedicated interest in volleyball. Faith is a theater kid with an incredible singing voice. And hope is a design minded, very meticulous, um, hard working person who um, is very creative. They're all very creative in their own uh, special ways, and they're good people, and they're good girls, and I'm very proud of them. Um, I wrote a I wrote a song the the night of my diagnosis. I started it. We we um, I got diagnosed, and we were planning to go to 
Callaway Gardens to see the fantasy in life. And so Jen's instinct was let's not go. And I'm like, oh, I mean, we have the room. We've bought the tickets. Let's just go and not, you know, not disrupt our holiday. And that night I couldn't sleep. And I started thinking about what um, I could possibly say to them if I were in a position where I couldn't speak. And I started jotting down the, uh, the, uh, these ideas. And uh, the chorus is, I love you forever. You know, and that's all that matters. You know, everything goes wrong. Everything goes right. Uh, sideways, up and down, all through it all, I love you forever, even if, even if this thing kills me and I'm not here, my love for you is forever. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm looking for the right way to put that song out into the world, but, um, it was a moment where I had a, a chance to really speak my mind. And that's the, one of the beauties of music is um, even if someone is unable to communicate the songs that, that I've uh, written and performed will always be there for them. And, um, and I, I take comfort in that. That's, that's, uh, kind of like my, my dad did that with his book. Not to talk for you, dad, but in one of my dad's books, he writes in one of his kids' books that came out right after he got diagnosed. I don't even know if it was public at that point, but he wrote a message to my, I have a brother who's a lot younger than me. He's still in high school. And, uh, my dad wrote him a message at the end of one of the books through one of the characters, but, no, I, I think at that point, no one knew you had ALS, Dad. Is that right? Yeah, so nobody nobody knew you, just like our family. And my dad left, like, a, I guess, like an Easter egg in his in his art. You know, your art's the music, his is the book. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a, I'd love to hear the song, Hop. Whenever, whenever you get it, you got to let us know. Well, I'll send it to you guys if you promise not to share it. But, um, you know... It's the kind of thing where I get to the end of the first chorus and it's, I love you forever. Boys don't need nearly as much as they tell you. Patience is prudent when all hell breaks loose. Children need holding. Even when scolding, it's just like this book of lessons that my parents taught me and, and that I, the things I've learned. And I'll send it to you guys after. Um, but I'm trying to continue while I can still sing to, uh, make more of those songs and things that they can cling to and um my voice is uh been affected by this um i have trouble controlling the the cavity between my nose and my throat and oh, and, oh i have this nasal thing that i that i can't overcome on a microphone but you know as, as long as I'm still singing it I'm still bringing it so that's my mantra I love it one other thing Hop is uh, at the end of every episode we we ask the guests so we have uh, one of the things we want to do obviously raise awareness for ALS but we also want to just have you know interesting conversations with interesting people, regardless of their background. 
Um, I won, we were, we were cautious about when my dad started a podcast, we didn't want it to be just an ALS podcast or just a author's podcast or just a football podcast. So we say to everybody at the end of the episode, um, you know, who are, who are some people that, you know, that you think we should have, try to get on to tell their story and, you know, people who have interesting stories or, you know, whatever, just any background. Um, Within the ALS community? No, no, it could be from anything. Uh, you know, one of the best um, songwriters in the world is Daryl Scott, D-A-R-R-E-L-L. And um, he would be an incredible guest for um, any questions about uh, songwriting if you get into his career um, and his music you you will definitely be a fan um, start with a tune called The Man Who Could Have Played Bass for Sha Na Na I'm writing it down John Driscoll Hopkins I want to wish you and your family continued blessings and I want to thank you for coming on our podcast which is dedicated towards raising money and awareness for ALS, much like your own efforts with Hop on a Cure. I wish we met under different circumstances, but I am happy to have you in my life. Thanks so much, Tim, for having me. You're an inspiration, and all of these questions were incredibly entertaining, and I'm really honored that you asked me. Awesome. Thanks so much, Hop. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green, and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son Troy each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarkleyDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barkley Damon for supporting this podcast and, of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com for cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital. If you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com. Thank you.